Thank you for coming to a very short talk about the network. Uh, my name is Milos, and today I'm going to tell you about uh, Milne and Milne, um, and sort of how their ratios can be the way you kind of develop the blockchain applications and this blockchain development in general. Uh, the way I've sort of set up this uh, presentation is in three parts. Uh, the first part is going to be about the network and how it's going to be able to do this in the world of Milne, which is explaining what Milne is. And the world, you know, to explain what Milne is and sort of telling you what kind of challenges we're facing today uh, with blockchain development. The second part of the presentation is really focused on what we've built so far, um, how it works and how it all connects together, and the final part is, of course, uh, just like what we expect to have in the near future and how it's going to work in the near future. Um, yeah, just a single slide about me. Uh, I'm one of the core engineers at Milne. Uh, I've been a program engineer for four years. I specialize in uh, specifically blockchain and blockchain clients, the lower level of protocol technology that makes blockchain run. Uh, you can find me on the social media, so you can just find me as you talk with Okay, so to give you uh, a brief introduction about you know, what, what the Milnet is and uh, how, it's, how it's useful, uh, we kind of need to go back uh, back a few years uh, to its real lesson uh, and explain the lore. Um, and uh, we need to ask the question about what are smart contracts really. Um, and an example in 94 sort of defined, defined this by contract as any kind of computerized transaction protocol that executes some kind of terms of a contract. Uh, and then this sort of similar paper they wrote, uh, one of the examples they used was just like a regular vending machine. A vending machine is like the very basic form of a smart contract, right? It has uh, predefined inputs, so you select what you want, you enter money, and you get something out of it, right? Uh, and it's always deterministic in the sense that if you repeat the same process, you're always going to get sort of the same results. Um, and a few years after that, we kind of evolved uh, it's using more and more complicated financial instruments. Uh, Bitcoin came, up, came along and we kind of redefined the way we think about digital currency. Um, and a few years after that, we uh, really needed to uh, basically, we really needed to increase our game uh, with. Uh, with the, the kind of logic that we want from, from, from blockchain and uh, from our own application peripherally. Uh, and so along came Solidity and Viper uh, and other uh, smart contract languages. But the solutions that we sort of built today are really not super perfect. And this is meant to be a talk to kind of this Solidity or um, encourage you to not use Solidity. Um, but we gotta go over like a few problems that we have. Uh, the solutions that we have now uh, with Solidity and Viper, they are not uh, the barrier to entry for any kind of newcomer that's coming in the space. It's really, it's really not minimal. Like this is an example of a very simple Solidity smart contract. Um, and somebody who's coming from a uh, web tour environment, they, they've worked in Rust, they've worked in Go, they've worked in all these programming languages, and yet now need to learn a new language from scratch and basically learn these intricacies from, from the very beginning. In order to be effective in, in actually using and inviting and participating in this kind of washing conversation that we have throughout the world. Um, and of course, you have tools to mitigate this. So you have platforms like Crypto Zombies or Solidity, for example, or uh, during uh, Crypto Summer, sorry, DeFi Summer, um, I think at pretty much every YouTube channel was uh, putting out Solidity tutorials. Uh, so there is uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of material to run if you want to learn Solidity. Um, but the general, the general just is, it's uh, not easy for anybody who's uh, unfamiliar with blockchain technology or why anybody would actually use a language that's very specifically designed for, for the blockchain context. Um, final, uh, second part is, uh, because Solidity is sort of designed with one thing in mind, it's designed to make your blockchain applications run and execute some kind of logic that's tied to any kind of execution runtime that's running in the background on your node. Um, being as, as designed with this in mind, it's kind of uh, limited uh, with, uh, with respect to design tools. But on the other hand, it's not really limited in the kind of exploits that people can be finding. Oh, I think they took it back. So limited in design and 
service, but it's not really limited in, in the kind of exploits that we've been finding over the last few years, and uh, generally the, the exploits that have been, been coming out. Uh, they're still coming out today. Um, and finally, uh, I want to touch on this, this topic of source code transparency and auditability. Uh, the way we sort of write Solidity Smart Contracts today is if I, as a developer, write some kind of source code and I want to publish it on the blockchain for somebody else to actually use it, uh, they really have no way of validating that this source code is actually correct. Um, I don't know if you guys have like the same problem where in your like crypto wallet you have like thousands or hundreds of like different coins or literally like fake tokens, right? And you can't really delete them or move them out of your wallet because that requires you to trigger some kind of action on the blockchain, right? It re requires you to select like nearest twenty and it requires you to trigger like a transfer method. Um, and by triggering the transfer method. Uh, without even actually knowing like what the, what the contract is, is supposed to be executing. You risk uh, allowing allowing the contract to uh, manipulate your funds or in some in some way uh, sort of uh, fish you for, for any kind of malicious action. Um, so we developed a kind of uh, solution to this problem. Uh, Etherscan has a tool where uh, if you want to verify that the source code of the contract is correct, you essentially what you do is you upload the source code. Etherscan executes it and it compares it to like the point by code on the contract. Because in the end, this is what that was actually being stored on the chain. Um, when you deploy a small solidity smart contract, you're not actually storing the source code on, on the chain, you're actually storing the deploy by code that the EVM actually executes. Um, so this is what basically Etherscan does, is that if you supply the uh, source code on the, on the solidity contract, it executes it and then it compares it to the, the source code that's deployed on chain. And this is how you know that um, the, the source code is sort of valid. It, it matches whatever whatever is up in the chain. Um, so having these kind of limitations uh, in mind with Solidity and, and in general smart contract platform today, um, I, I want to touch on what actually is NoLand and uh, why why run this talk. Um, so NoLand is uh, a layer one blockchain um, that aims to address some of the key problems that we've been having in the blockchain space, specifically uh, one, of the, one of the most specific things is focusing on making smart contract development as easy as possible and as intuitive as possible for uh, new kind of users. And the way we do this is we don't kind of rely on existing technologies. Uh, for our smart contract language, we uh, use an interpreter version of Go, which is called Gno, Gnoang, or Gno for short. And I'm going to go over it uh, in, in a minute. Um, <coughs> So, you know, uh, there are many benefits to using, uh, to basing uh, a smart contract language for your, any blockchain platform or your blockchain platform on something that is very recognizable and accessible like, uh, like Go is. Um, you essentially do not have the, 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 the uphill climb that you have with Solidity where people need to learn like uh, modifiers, where they need to learn uh, how the transaction is executed uh, in the background. Um, you can transition an entire subset of web two developers to to a more actually participating by blockchain logic, um, and this is like one of the one of the experiences that we have going around to go conferences across the world. Um, we we've been to go for um, EU. We're now going to go for kind of less in a few days, um, and always uh, the questions are, uh, oh cool, uh, I would love to to learn how to write uh, any kind of logic in an version of Go. But the blockchain space to me is like very like people generally in web web two web two developers are very wary of uh, developing or actually participating in the space. Um, and by basing something uh, something on uh, some, uh, basing your language on something as recognizable as Go, you would sort of ease this kind of barrier of entry. Um, the second part is uh, Go is really transparent. We just talked about how Solidity contracts when they're uploaded. When you're executed and uploaded, uh, you don't get the actual source code, and somebody needs to actually verify it here. Uh, with Gnome, you don't have this problem, and I'll explain it in a second. Um, source code transparency is really at, at the forefront. Um, you upload entire source code files, you don't upload any kind of interpreted like code or any, anything that has been post processed before. So, as the developer wrote it, whether it's a smart contract or it's a package, um, the way they wrote it and the way they sort of envision it is actually uploaded to, to the chain. And uh, I like to mention this uh, one line that, that's uh, said by your toolmates, so upload source is not binaries. Uh, this is one of the problems that you have with 
platforms like Cosmosm, where uh, you cannot, you, you, you always need to deal with uh, like a, a middle, a middle, uh, a middle, a middle man medium for, uh, for source code, okay. whether it's a binary or it's uh, some kind of encoding of the binary. And finally, uh, one thing, uh, one of the benefits of uh, racing that on Go is you get really all the superpowers that Go gives you for uh, for for a programming language uh, and more, right? So you get the simplicity. Of Go, but you also get convenience. Go is not built for uh, for the blockchain context, uh, and it's definitely uh, definitely not not built for um, for the kind of uh, blockchain applications that we want to build. Uh, but it gives us uh, this kind of simplicity that we can use, and it gives us uh, this completeness uh, in different aspects of that we sort of never had in vision from, from the beginning, web security um, and others. Um, it's really designed for, uh, Go is really designed for interchain smart contract systems, so the idea is uh, not to have like a single no land chain uh, that you use, uh, like like many Ethereum, big Ethereum networks. The idea is, is to, uh, for there to exist like many kind of different node blockchains. Uh, they're running, they have uh, an execution engine for you know, contracts, uh, and they can interact. So you, for example, can call a smart contract that's on like a different kind of blockchain and have it uh, return some data. Um, and finally, you get uh, the a very powerful standard library, so whatever is, is in Go, you actually kind of need to know. Uh, but you also have this interesting concept of, uh, of a new package marketplace. Our idea when we started going is we wanted to build a platform for people share source code um, to be much more open source and to be uh, much more free in actually auditing and actually sharing knowledge. Um, and what we want to build is essentially a package marketplace where people, uh, when they upload source code, whether it's like a smart contract or it's a package, every, anybody can use it and anybody can audit it and anybody can actually read it. So, um, as I mentioned, we're a layer one, we're a layer one chain. Uh, and this means that we have kind of all the bells and whistles of, of a regular uh, layer one stack. So we have an execution engine, which is the node yet, uh, that executes in the one language. Uh, we have a consensus mechanism called memory two. We use a consensus protocol called proof of contribution, and I'll talk about this in a second. Um, but we also have, uh, of course, um, external world, world APIs that interact with wallets or any kind of different client applications. Um, it might be kind of odd that I mentioned uh, Chainery 2 and how it relates to sort of Chainery uh, 4. Uh, Chainery 2 is essentially a fork of Chainery 4 uh, from a certain point in time. Um, and it's made with really a uh, few principles in mind. Um, the way we wanted to design a consensus mechanism, or sorry, a consensus protocol, um, we sort of took Chainery 4 and we wanted to see, okay, what can we strip or what can we add to make it adhere to some of, some of the principles that we adhere to the community and that we need to kind of follow within the project? Uh, one of those is, of course, simplicity of design. And uh, we believe that anything that is too complicated uh, needs, needs to actually go. Uh, we believe that code is the same. Um, if you have a readable code, that means that the code is audible, that means that people can actually trust uh, what, they're, what they're executing on your engine. Um, is what's, what's going on. If they can understand it, then they, they can use it right. Um, other principles we have, modular dependencies and improvements. So we aim to um, severely uh, modularize the way Terminate is work, Terminate works. Um, if, you, if, you, if you're familiar with Terminate Core stack, uh, generally uh, Terminate Core can be considered as parts of like, if, if, you're, if you're familiar with how blockchain clients work in general, Terminate Core is like a subset of of those, those clients, right? So it contains like your networking, it contains uh, an execution engine, it contains peer to peer, um, all these like different moving parts, right? Uh, we aim to sort of uh, not strip that away, but kind of modularize it so it can be swappable, you can change whatever you want, and you don't have to use proof contribution that I mentioned in, in the previous slide um, that I mentioned soon as well. Uh, you can use proof of authority, you can use proof of state, uh, you can swap out your network implementation, you can swap out anything that you might want to use. Um, and you might be wondering, like, why would anybody do this? Um, there is a, a large niche of people who uh, really want to customize their entire blockchain experience. Uh, people who run their own, like, rollups or, or app chains. Um, they care about some of these things. They care about whether or not 
they're losing traffic, they're losing performance in network traffic, or whether their consent software is not uh, working as it should. Finally, uh, we sort of aim to have minimal tilt, uh, minimal dependencies. We are any kind of dependency that we use within the project. Um, this sort of goes back to the story about completeness, where the 1.10 or 2 should completely be maintained by the community in, in the form of like bug fixes and vulnerability fixes. Uh, and it shouldn't really be uh, maintained with uh, bigger design choices uh, and fancy or flashy features. We just want to create the bare minimum that's uh, the bare minimum, um, the bare minimum tool is going to be used for, for years to come, and not change the real requirement, just uh, just being cached. Okay, uh, so I mentioned proof of contribution uh, a few slides ago. Uh, what proof of contribution is, is essentially a consensus mechanism that's aimed to replace proof of stake. Um, in a regular proof of stake system or um, something that's uh, permissioned like uh, proof of authority, um, you have uh, a, a large, large probability of having your validators corrupted. Um, in proof of stake, whoever sort of stakes, uh, stakes the most, they can become a validator. And um, we're sort of seeing this emergence with uh, not only just Ethereum, but other uh, private proof of stake networks where uh, specific entities or a small majority of people actually uh, control the majority of the network. Um, proof of authority, of course, you, you decide who, who's sort of validating the network, so it's much, uh, much more close to that. Uh, what the, the proof of contribution kind of works is you become a validator based on your contributions to the And this doesn't have to be specifically a code contribution, it can be um, any kind of contribution that sort of moves the needle on the project. So any kind of discussion or um, proposal or specification or um, just general improvement to, to the actual protocol and to, to the project. Um, what is deemed sort of by the contribution valve or the attending um, as, as a contribution, it, uh, it qualifies it qualifies you to be uh, one, of the, one of the validators in the validator network. So you, the inner benefits you have here are um, you have a much, much uh, more secure and decentralized uh, blockchain. Um, you have a very high, a very high potential for high decentralization of source of code support, where uh, not where not a few not, not a few of your a few entities can control what's what's being done in the network. Um, you can only be a validator if, if your if your uh, contribution is being uh, is being valid, and you cannot basically run two nodes as a, as a single entity or person. Okay, um, so some of the challenges that we sort of ran into while we were building kind of this, this, this system. The first one is obviously um, if we have like a novel uh, smart country language, um, what kind of runtime do we actually use to, to run it? Right? How do we execute this code? Um, and really, there was nothing on the market, so we had to build something else. We built the Gnomium from scratch. Um, the Gnomium works a bit differently than most virtual machines. Um, it's especially blockchain virtual machines like EVM. Uh, no use, no use uh, human readable paths for contracts. This means that uh, when you deploy a, a, a smart contract or you deploy a package, it's not located at like a, he at like a hex address. It's located at something that's human readable like a domain. So, for example, node.land slash r slash, uh, you know, or node.land slash p slash nodes or whatever. And you can act, it's basically like GitHub. You can, um, you can segment out with code pieces uh, and, and be sure that people can actually reach you and people can actually produce it. You don't have to remember this, uh, what is like the address of this smart contract or how do I import like a package. You can only, you can do import and then just specify the human readable name. Um, and the reason we're sort of able to do this is um, we don't have this intermediary step that VVM has where they take the source code, run it through um, a compiler, and then generate bytecode that EVM actually executes. We, we cut cut the step out. Um, we upload, as I mentioned, the user can upload actual source code, and this source code is, is what's directly being interpreted by EVM as it's executing the as it's executing transactions. So at no point in time is any kind of bytecode being executed. It's always going to be the actual source code representation. The way we do this is we take a source code uh, generate and generate an ACM representation of it, and we basically traverse the ACP. Um, 
what this does is it kind of promotes simplicity, uh, removes uh, ambiguity uh, for users and developers. Uh, when you import something, you can actually step into the code and actually see that you know what you expect to be executed is uh, being executed. Okay. And the final thing is, of course, that it cancels enhances kind of uh, discovering different contracts and discovering different packages and fosters this uh, open source community that we want to build. Uh, the second challenge that we ran into was figuring out what kind of tools work and what kind of tools don't work. Um, you can't really use, if, it's, if, if your blockchain network is not EVM based, you cannot really use MetaMask or use uh, Web3.js or Web3.js uh, to interact with web 3 so you've got to build those tools from scratch. Um, and it's part of something I, I, I jokingly call here the ecosystem tooling pillars, um, which, is, which are basically high libraries. Smart contract standards and uh, user facing applications like wallets and explorers. And all of these things sort of need to come together in order to build your ecosystem that's, that's custom made. Uh, client libraries, of course, you need, you need some kind of middleware code uh, for applications to interact with your blockchain. So whether it's like a React app or it's something completely different, it needs some kind of middleware or a common language to speak with like the, actual, the actual blockchain that is going in the background. Um, you obviously need smart contract standards. We mentioned that uh, over the past few years, our kind of needs have evolved over um, what we want out of a blockchain project. So we're developing like more complex applications over the years. Um, these smart contract standards are like ERC20 tokens, ERC721, composable entities, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and finally, of course, you need user facing applications. So something that really enhances the arts, which is like block explorers, custom wallets. And all of these things sort of need to work together because you can't have a wallet if you don't have a good client library. And if your wallet doesn't support like NFTs or tokens, uh, meaning it doesn't support smart contract standards, then it's not really a useful wallet. It doesn't give you any kind of functionality you need. Uh, so today, how you, you can integrate essentially you know, with your apps. We offer uh, official package support for app developers. Um, uh, the first kind of uh, package support that, we, that, we, that we've done uh, has been for JavaScript and TypeScript uh, because most people develop React apps. Uh, as we saw in, in Bruno's uh, talk uh, a few minutes ago, um, it's, it's all on the cloud and it's all in this like, same pack, JavaScript pack. Um, we're uh, working with an external team called Brady on uh, developing a knowing client. Um, essentially, an SDK that you can use to, uh, to plug in and use your Lego apps. And interact with Nojing. Uh, but if you wanted to use a wallet, um, as I mentioned, it's like one of the US pillars. Um, currently, uh, there are multiple wallets being implemented from, from now. I think we have an internal wallet that's, that's in the works. Um, but sort of the most widely used wallet that we have is the day wallet that's uh, made by Gamma Blockchain. And the final challenge we kind of ran into was how do we validate the direction, the direction we're going? With the entire ecosystem and the entire blockchain is kind of sound. How do we verify that the implementation is right? Um, and for this, I think really not stress enough how important it is to have uh, great implementation partners. Um, kind of all of the work that we do um, would not be would really be in vain if uh, it wasn't used by anybody else. Uh, and we were very grateful to have uh, great teams and, and, and developers who are. Behind projects, who actually want to use them. So, for example, we have a team from South Korea on block that is building a wallet. They're going to do a full exchange. They're building block explorers. Uh, we have a team from France, territory. They're building moderation down, and kind of down communication that can use. We have the Bird team, which I'm not sure where it's based at. Maybe France. Maybe France. Uh, but uh, distributed. Yeah. <laughs> they're working on uh, bringing uh, you know, to mobile devices, uh, and they're working on the go they go find implementation. Of course, we have over 100 contributors at GitHub who have, for free, basically dedicated their time to making the entire company better. Uh, and these are sort of the parties that actually verify that what you're building is, is sound. What you're building is actually works for real world use cases. Um, and yeah, the eventual question we always get asked is like, when is the name happening? And we kind of have a different approach towards uh, doing launches. Uh, we are not rushing to do a single launch that's pull out, pull out all the features that we want to that we want to get out um, on a single day, and then just sort of spend the next few years fixing those features. Um, we plan to do a very minimal 
uh, minimal production launch uh, early next year. Um, so basically, just the base feature set for production limit, and then do many launches after that. So do a very small launch in the beginning, and then do uh, different uh, feature launches like integrating uh, interchain or um, adding like a different implementation to the OPM and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And it's expected in uh, Q1 of next year. Um, if you want to learn more about you know, we're, uh, I would say for, for the vast, vast majority of the work we do, we're open source. Uh, every, all of our communication, everything is sort of on GitHub. You can find us on GitHub. Um, we have an awesome new repo going, and you can find us on Discord uh, as well. Uh, and yeah, uh, the last thing I wanted to mention was email help. So currently we have uh, an ongoing developer competition for uh, building all things to know. And it's sort of divided into two phases. One phase is uh, building uh, the option components that we need, uh, and that's sort of on the way. Uh, the second phase is uh, building, uh, it's an on-chain on company. So um, what this basically means is phase one is building the tools that we need for phase two. Um, yeah, that, 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 the tools right. are the tournament version, um, and additional support for, for launching the functionality. And uh, phase two is really just like a smart contract company. So building much better smart contracts and building much better packages. And we sort of allocated, I think, over 100,000 pounds uh, for the contribution. So if anybody is interested, um, these contributions do not have to be like source code contributions. They can be uh, also like discussions or concepts or um, generalized specifications, whatever you sort of think uh, to talk to customers and stuff, there's a kind of thing that is much appreciated in the world. Does anybody have any questions? The knowledge is using the demand of sensors and for the technical music for the city or something? No, no, so it's not, it's not based on cost. That's one, of the, that's one of the biggest challenges that we have is um, if you want to integrate, for example, IDC into your apps, you cannot integrate IDC if you're not built with the process of it because it's an SPD module. The only implementation that is, is, is an SPD module. And I think there's a section on, on the end documentation that basically you're in a flow chart and it says, is your app built with process of decay? And if the answer is yes, then you can use the IDC module. And if it's not, then it literally says write everything from scratch. <laughs> Write the actual IP sense specification to the specification to the specification using the specs. Um, yeah, you notice that it's not built with, uh, with any kind of version of processes that came right from the record. We've taken some concepts from, from the SDK, since this is in fact what the project started by JCon, so it was one of the authors of, of Tenement and a whole process of the system. Uh, but we haven't, we haven't based anything uh, on having like module com compatibility with. I think it's I think it's in, it, it's not in the near future we're about that. Uh, one of the ideas is for us to have, uh, for example, like proof of contribution in a uh, cosmos SDK module, or just abstract away like different parts of of now uh, to be a module that you can plug into your own like, cosmos SDK. But like full on support for for cosmos SDK module, I don't think that's that's in the plan. At least, like, not in your future. Do you know how does the smart contract update its state? How does it update its state? Yeah, I know the answer, but I think it's one of the coolest things about you know. <laughs> yeah, so um, essentially, how you do uh, state management for any kind of change is you snapshot, um, I mean, you need a delimiter for, for state changes, right? Um, I mean, like a global variable. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I just want to mention. Uh, generally, like how blockchains store state is, you need to have uh, basically a state delimiter. So, um, in general, in general, like the blockchain context, um, this is the block number, right? So you snapshot state and you use block number and you kind of store. Either like differences in state where you store on like the entire state, right? Um, for most specifically, on the liquid, I think you store um, the differences in the state. Um, in terms of like how smart contracts are stored, they're stored um, as, as literally as the same as user output. Uh, they are stored as in, uh, use an ABL representation for state. So we don't use like Marble Patricia trees that are using Ethernet, we use uh, IABL. 
It's the same, it's the same data source that's used for the process. Anyone else? Yeah, I have a question. I, I mean, like in Solidity, there's this explicit uh, call you have to make to, to update mm -hmm. the state. But in, in, in you know, you just have a global variable. It might be a, a, a list, mm -hmm. and you write some Go code to append something to the list, and it's magically persistent. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't, you don't like differentiate between methods having uh, being like modifiers and modifying states. So you don't have to mod say, okay, this method actually only works with in-memory variables, or you don't need to load something from state like in state. Everything is is sort of abstracted. So you're, you're writing Go code, well, Go code, but um, it's much more intuitive.